Uh, Daniel Harris joins us next on OTBAM to reflect on an Ole Gunnar Solskjaer masterclass in the Manchester Derby. It was all live on Sunday's Off the Ball with Brian Kerr and Stephen Doyle. Free kick by Bruno Fernandes just chipped into the box. Martial volleys it into the back of the net. That is a wonderful goal by Manchester United. Created by the new man around the place, Bruno Fernandes. And then volleyed home by Anthony Martial. It's Manchester United 1, Manchester City 0 on the half hour mark. Now it's rolled out by Edison. Give it away to McTominay. He has a shot and he finds the net. Scott McTominay has put the seal on the Manchester Derby this afternoon. A dreadful mistake by Edison. And with 96 minutes on the clock, Scott McTominay makes it Manchester United 2. Manchester City nil. Manchester is red tonight. Yeah, Manchester's red tonight. Daniel Harris, good morning to you. Hello. So, um, all season long we've been waiting for... Uh, a discernible piece of evidence, that, enough evidence to suggest that Ole Gunnar Solskjaer was going the right direction. Have you seen enough? Is he going the right direction? I think it's like, for me, and I've been saying it to you for quite some time, for more than a year now, that you can see that it's been going in the right direction since he took over. That never meant that he was necessarily the right guy for the job or necessarily good enough for the job. But very quickly, it seemed to me like he, his man management was pretty good. He clued up who the players were, who he wanted to keep, and who the ones were that he wanted to get rid of. As far as I was concerned, they were the right decisions. And we've seen that. And I've been saying all along that if he got himself in midfield, then we would see whether he was any good. But in the meantime, there was some, there was evidence that there was a plan, and he was doing well in the big games, and he wasn't doing well in the big games because he was fluking them. And I think what we've got now is we've got United have got a midfield, and it's possible to see... We knew what the uh, tactics were, but now we're seeing more of a strategy as well. We're seeing within the way that United want to play, the players are improving and they're moving around quite nicely in the system. Explain what the strategy is, because it, there's, there's a bit of a debate. Um, some of the football writers are wondering if there is actually a discernible Ole Gunnar Solskjaer style. Um, I think that when you start describing style, it's quite a nebulous term, as in like, there's not a list of styles that have names. It's not like art where there's Baroque and Brutalist and this, that and the other. But what you're looking for is, I guess, repeating patterns of play. And what's happened with United is they've signed Bruno Fernandes and he has released the front players to actually make the runs that front players should make because there's a possibility that they might get the ball. We're seeing Luke Shaw, who was uh, excellent again yesterday and has been really, really good now for about 10 games in a row, which is uh, unprecedented, I would say, in Luke Shaw's United career. We're seeing that he's offering a lot more going forward. We're seeing the fullbacks getting forward. We're seeing the defenders with more confidence to bring the ball out. And I can't, apart from, until McTominay scored yesterday, I actually couldn't remember the last time United scored a goal on the counter-attack because for a while, Ole was, and United were criticised that they're just trying to score on the counter-attack. They're just booting it at their fast players and I don't think that was ever really the case what the case was was that they didn't have the players to play through midfield particularly when they were playing a superior team so that was just the only way that they really were able to play and we saw some signs against Manchester City um, when, they, when they beat them at the Etihad in the league that people kind of categorised that that first half where United scored twice and could have scored more as another counter-attack performance. But it wasn't really the case. United passed through midfield that day really well because that was sort of the first time that they had Fred and McTominay playing well together. And now they've got Matic also playing well and Bruno Fernandes playing well. And although the, against City, obviously, they had very little possession because City are a better team than them, the United threat in, that, in the game wasn't on the counter, really. It was only on the counter at the end. It was... When United got the ball, they were able to pass it and keep it well. And the first goal came at the end of a period of United pressure that wasn't United sitting deep and countering and sitting deep and countering. It was United taking the ball and having the ball in good areas and creating chances and eventually taking one. So, to, to, to double back on that then, what they're trying to do is to play through midfield, to be as effective again, like to, to try and create chances as often and as frequently as they can, uh, not necessarily only doing that from a counter-attacking position or from a defensive position. Yeah, and you're seeing particularly midfield players that are now passing the ball forwards, particularly Fred, who runs with the ball, and he takes, he, he takes risks with his passing. I mean, he's still quite careless in possession sometimes. He's got better. 
but he's got people to aim at and he's now passing the ball forward. Bruno Fernandes always gets the ball and he's already had a look before he even gets the ball at moving the ball forward. Anthony Martial looks much more like a centre forward and I mean he was brilliant yesterday. And I I don't want to get too excited about him because we've seen this before. We know that his top level is a high level. The problem with him has always been that his bottom level is a absolutely shite level. And the question is whether he can raise that bottom level. But what we've seen from him in the last few weeks is he's been getting goals when he hasn't been playing well. And that is that is progress for him. So we're seeing we're seeing players building little understandings between them as well. And that's also quite important when you're trying to develop a way of playing. So Fernandez and Martial appear to have hit it off quite well. And when we saw Martial move for Fernandez yesterday, well, for the first goal, that was obviously a pre-rehearsed move. But the, when you when you're a striker and you have a centre for and you have a midfield player behind you who sees passes and can execute the passes, especially when you're someone like Anthony Anthony Martial, who's not always given to intense effort, you're more likely to gamble. You're more likely to run to the front post. You're more likely to run in behind because there's a chance that the ball might come. It's remarkable how quickly Bruno Fernandes has slotted in, Daniel, because like it seemed to me that if you look at, say, Liverpool and Manchester City down through the years, their system, especially without the ball in terms of pressing, has taken a little while to get up to speed. Whereas it seems now Manchester United without the ball revolves around Bruno Fernandes. They are pressing almost from Bruno Fernandes. He is the lead in all of this. And it seems like he's been a guy who's playing for the club for two years. Yeah, I mean, I think that's partly to do with United's requirements were for Bruno Fernandes to turn up straight away. Liverpool mm. say could sign Fabinho, and they were good, so they could wait for Fabinho. But United signed Bruno Fernandes, who was obviously just desperate to get involved, and they signed, they're signing a player who is more or less the finished article. He's not at his peak yet because he he's, only, he's, he's 25, but he's been playing brilliantly for two seasons, so he's absolutely ready. <laughs> And I think the thing with him is his attributes happen to fit very nicely for English football in that he has all the ability on the ball and around the box with, with his passing. He sees the passes, but he also has that bit of moxie. Like He's, he's a bit nasty, um, he's, he's, he's fast, and he's quite tough. And when you put all those things together, United's team was missing Bruno Fernandes. And when you put all those, those aspects together, then it's not that surprising that he's fitting straight away. And what United actually have to do now is they need to find another player like Bruno Fernandes because ultimately if you, it remains the case that if you stop Bruno Fernandes then you're not going to stop United counter-attacking but as an attacking force when in the way that they want to dictate the play if you stop Bruno Fernandes you're more or less going to stop United so what they need now is they need another attacking player so that they then become much harder to stop in the way that we've seen with City where they would always play Fernandinho in midfield and then two attacking players so if you sit on De Bruyne then one of the Silvers will be there or Gundogan will be there. And United now need to find that player in the summer. They're not that hard to find, it turns out. I mean, there are several of them out there. And certainly, if you have a uh, war chest, to uh, use the parlance of the uh, transfer lingo that we all know and love, um, which they'll get from selling Pogba, then actually there's loads of candidates for that role. All of a sudden, things have turned from, ooh, this could be a very long rebuild to... Starting next season, everybody's back on zero points and you would expect Manchester United to be decent. Like, proper uh, yeah. top four. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that United's best, although we haven't really seen much of it this season because United's never really had all their best players available at the same time. I, I would guess, therefore, and I am guessing when I say this, that I think United's best is probably the third best of the teams in the league. It's still quite a way behind City when they've got everyone available because City are a team that have been together for four years and they have a manager who is proven at being brilliant. But I think one of the things that I think I've been saying with Solskjaer from the beginning is that his, when, you, when you employ a young manager, particularly when you employ a young manager to supervise a mess, you've got to be prepared for them to take time to learn to get better. And um, I think that Matic said last week, actually, that Solskjaer is a miles better manager than he was this time last year. And I think that as much as you're waiting for the players to grow and develop, you're also waiting for the manager and the coaching team to grow and develop. And perhaps he could have sped that along by hiring himself an experienced coach, but you're seeing him and the people around him are likely to improve and you'll see the team likely to improve as well. So it can improve in an organic way just by everyone getting better. But yeah, it does also need some players with some money. And whether Pogba goes or not, I mean, I expect Pogba to go. Problem being that, the teams who A, have the money to buy Pogba and B, want Pogba are few and far between. Um, yeah, I, I, I've seen various people talk about they need three players. Um, one is a right winger. Is Aaron Wan-Bissaka then 
one of that back three or is this back three uh, completely decided by the quality of the opposition so you'll only use a back three when you're playing against say a Liverpool or a Manchester City or if they're in Champions League football next season against the, the top team in the Champions League the rest of the time they'll go back to a flat back four. Yeah, I think so. Um, I mean, I think Juan Bissaka could actually be a decent centre-back, actually, but he's a really good right-back, and we're seeing him get much better going forward. And if he has a proper right-winger in front of him, then I think you'll see a lot more, I think you'll see a lot more from him going forward, because at the moment, he's had to be a one-man flank. And when there's someone better alongside him, I think you'll see a lot more from him going forward. As far as the three at the back goes, I'm not sure even necessarily that United will play it next season in the big games. I think they're playing it in the big games now because... They know that they're not as good as the better teams that they're playing in midfield. So they need to find a way of being secure at the back, not losing the numbers game in midfield while still having an attacking threat. Whereas if they add another midfield player in the summer, then they might feel that they can take on the better midfields in on equal terms. So if, if you're playing a midfield, as United have done against Liverpool, that has Andreas Pereira and Matic in it, then you're going to have a problem because Andreas Pereira lacks quality and Matic can't run about a lot. Whereas if you even had a midfield of McTominay, Fred and, um, and Bruno Fernandes, you're starting to put together a combination that you think could match Henderson, Wijnaldum and Fabinho in a lot of aspects. You wouldn't necessarily need to have an extra man at the back. So I don't think that's necessarily the plan going forward, but I can see why it's the plan at the moment. OK. Um, the questions about Solskjaer's future... Which, so we, we've been through this very similar pattern where in the big games the team plays really well and then they'll follow it up with some bad performances against mediocre sides. Um, there seems to have been a good bit more consistency now over the last six weeks. Um, maybe that's a bit too generous, but much better certainly than it had been in the early part of the season. Those conversations seem to have disappeared. It's now safe to assume that he's going to be the manager at the start of next season. Is that a fair comment? It looks like that now. Um... They're obviously, they, they might still collapse, in which case he might not be. But yeah, I, I, if they carry on, because it's actually, even since before the turn of the year, they've sort of started gubbing some of the, some of the crap teams um, at home and away. And uh, they've got like, they've, they've thrashed Newcastle, they've thrashed Norwich twice. Um, they've started to find ways of finding goals against the less good teams, partly because they're starting to put a midfield together and the, the confidence has grown. And that makes a massive difference. Obviously, they were terrible against Burnley. But apart from that, I don't. it's a long time since they've been absolutely terrible. And they look like they're going to score at least twice in most of the games. So, yeah, um, they seem to have found a way. And they haven't even got Rashford available at the moment. Uh, when Rashford's back then they will be a difficult a difficult proposition. You would expect them to win most of the games that you think that they should win. OK. A quick question about Liverpool here before we go. Um, the performance against Bournemouth at the weekend, not particularly great, but everybody's going, oh, OK, blips over now, they're back to winning ways. Uh, is it as straightforward as that? Are you confident that they're going to do it against Atletico? Uh, I'm not confident they're going to do it against Atletico. I wasn't confident that they were going to do it against Atletico when the draw was made because... Atletico are but it's precisely the kind of game that you would think Atletico would make difficult, difficult for anyone. And also, Atletico had the advantage, and I've always, I've always thought that it is an advantage of having the first leg at home. Because if you're a superior team, which let's say Liverpool are, you're able to almost finish the tie in the first leg if you can win it 2-0, 3-1 or something. Whereas if you're the inferior team, playing at home first allows you to get into the tie and keep the tie alive going into the second leg. And Atletico were excellent in the first game against Liverpool. And one of the things I felt about Liverpool, and I'll perhaps attract aggravation for saying this, is I actually think they played really well much more often last season. Um, I haven't seen every Liverpool game this season, and perhaps people who watch Liverpool every week will disagree with me. They were fantastic against Leicester, but that is the only game where I, perhaps the City game as well, where I can say I thought Liverpool were absolutely brilliant today. And I felt that last season they were brilliant much more often. And it's hard to find a performance when you really need one if you're not playing particularly consistently. Um, Liverpool still have the confidence, but the game against Atletico was that first time where, in almost a year, where they think actually they know that they can be beaten. And Liverpool, if you look at the confidence and the, the way that they've played, um, that Barcelona comeback since then... They've played like a team that doesn't think it can be beaten. And that doesn't mean when I say that, that they've played like a team that's playing really well. It's that if they're drawing and there's five minutes to go, they've played like a team that knows they're going to score. And it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. As the opposition know they're going to score as well. And that's when you see the late goals. And um, 
I felt like Liverpool had that and they might perhaps have just lost it because they've lost three games recently and yeah. they will know that and Atletico will know that as well. So I think that it's a really difficult game. I mean, it's a 50-50 game because I think that Atletico probably will score, which means Liverpool need to score three times to win. And um, that is hard to foresee, I would say. I think Atletico, I think, in fact, I will say, but I think if Atletico score, then they will go through. All right, Daniel, great to have you with us this morning. Thanks a million. All right, see you again. Um, some thoughts there on the weekend's uh, Manchester Derby. Uh, you can listen back to those goals on offtheball.com. Now, Tom Malone is in the studio next with us with the latest sports news here on OTBAM after uh, taking a point from Man United last weekend. Here's Gary Breen responding to Everton's 4-0 hammering yesterday at the hands of Chelsea. 